Thanks, Rich. So my name is Marcus Hutchins. I work in cyber threat intelligence, which is mostly tracking threat actors and the kind of techniques that they're using to get into people's networks. And today I'm going to be doing a hacking demo where we actually recreate a real world attack. Now, what makes this special is not just that it is a real world attack based on an actual scenario that actually happened, but it involved two entirely separate threat actors who probably had no idea what the other was doing. And their combined activity led to a full network-wide compromise and ransomware deployment event. Now, the story starts with our first threat actor, which is a nation state APT. Now, this APT was in possession of a Microsoft Exchange zero day exploit. And this exploit was actually a chain of zero days, which when combined allowed them to not only bypass the Exchange login uh, page, but also write arbitrary files to the Exchange server. And what they did with this is they wrote a web shell. And the web shell is simply just a publicly accessible file on the main exchange server the pipes commands to something like PowerShell or the command prompt. Essentially what it results in is a backdoor where the attackers are able to run commands on the local system via a publicly accessible uh, web page or web shell. Now, in this case, uh, that basically runs in the context of the current user, which is Microsoft Exchange. And Microsoft Exchange runs as NT authority slash system, which is the highest privilege account on a local Windows machine. It is, it's not a domain account. It doesn't have domain access just yet, but it is the most access you can get to a Windows system. So they're basically root. And this shell allows them to run commands as root. So what exactly went wrong? Well, there was a bit of an OPSEC failure with this APT and they were actually using the same exact web shell path on multiple different servers. In fact, it was across like a very large number of servers and uh, they were also reusing the same shell password. So basically anyone who knew the shell path and the password was able to run commands on the compromised system as root or NT authority slash system as Windows calls it. Now, uh, when the uh, security researchers caught onto this APT's activity, uh, they released threat reports and they uh, uh, listed indicators of compromise, which basically said, hey, if you see this, this, or this uh, on your server, you've probably been compromised. And one of those indicators of compromise was the shell path and the shell password, which basically meant they had told all of the threat actors out there, albeit inadvertently, that if they go and they check any exchange server and this file path exists, they can just log in with that password and they now have full unrestricted access to that exchange server. And surely that is what threat actors did. Um, now this one was a ransomware group. It was completely unassociated with this APT, completely different goals, financially motivated cybercrime actor. And what they did is they just scanned the entire internet for publicly accessible exchange servers, and then they looked for the shell path. And then once they actually got in, they would remove the APT shell, essentially locking them out of the network and taking the access for themselves. And they used Mimicats for privilege escalation, which I'll explain a bit about in a minute. But this is kind of like your worst case scenario for most network security professionals, because it's like, not only have you just been compromised by a hostile nation state APT, but uh, oh, they've, they've left the back door unlocked and now there's a bunch of ransomware actors having a party in your network. So like this is a really bad situation, especially for those who are having to do incident response. So Mimikatz is basically the Swiss army knife of credential dumping. It is a tool that allows you to dump credentials from all different parts of the Windows operating system. The system uh, has a tendency to cache login credentials. So when you log on to your workstation, that credential actually gets cached somewhere in memory. Now, usually it's hashed, uh, but those hashes can serve as passwords in a lot of cases on networks. And we're not gonna get into like the, it's like the super crazy details on how that actually works. All we need to understand is that dumping credentials is very bad and it potentially gives the attackers a lot of access to your network. Um, now, Mimicats can dump pretty much any kind of credential that is stored on a Windows system. So it is one of the most popular tools used by attackers. It's actually designed as a pen testing tool, 
But uh, as most of you have probably seen in the past, attackers absolutely love to use commercial pen testing tools because they give them amazing capabilities. So now we're gonna go into a demo where I'm actually gonna show you what the attacker did by hacking my test network using the same techniques that they used. So as you can see, we've got here is our standard Microsoft Exchange login page. This is our example exchange server, which has already been backdoored by the nation state APT uh, using their zero day. So if we go to the, um, uh, our notes, this is the shell path that would have been released by uh, the security vendors in their report. So they've given us this, uh, this path and I've removed the password just for brevity's sake, but they've also given us the password. So as a threat actor, we just, all we need to do is go to that URL on the exchange server and oh, it exists. And that means we now have access to this system. So we can just do who am I? And that's telling us we're NT authority slash system. All of our commands are being run with the most privileges possible on this local server. So the problem is we do have system privileges, but we don't have domain access. We can't get onto the domain controller. We could ransom this specific system, but we can't ransom the entire network. Um, so there's a couple of things the attacker did, and I've actually written down their playbook so you can uh, read the commands as I, as I go. So the first command is the net DOM query PDC, which basically just tells us what's the name of the domain controller, because we're gonna need to know that in order to interact with it. So we're just gonna put that command in here, and it tells us it is uncreatively named DC01. And if we wanted to get the uh, network IP of the domain controller, we can actually just do a ping to its, net by, uh, to its name. So, um, because the uh, name is basically a NetBIOS name, so a ping command will resolve the IP, and we've got the IP address just here. So next up, we have downloading and running Mimikatz. So what we're gonna do is, this command is gonna use PowerShell to download Mimikatz, and it's gonna run the Mimikatz command responsible for dumping credentials from the credential vault. And I'm gonna explain why this went wrong in a, in a minute, but we're actually just gonna see it in action first. So as you can see, we actually got a plain text password here, which is very, very rare. Like most Windows passwords are stored in a hashed format, but we got a plain text one, and that was due to an administrator misconfiguration. What we got here is actually a domain account. The domain is called company, and the account is named backup service. So we've compromised a service account, a non-human identity, and not only uh, were we able to like dump credentials from the account, we didn't even get a hash. We got the plain text password, which means we don't need to do any special kind of pass the hash attacks or anything fancy. We can just log right in. Um, but there is still one problem. The domain controller is not exposed to the internet. They've done something right in configuring this network, so we do still need to get onto the domain controller, which is where we can use a technique known as tunneling or port forwarding. Now, this command here basically tells the exchange server to connect to the domain controller on our behalf and then listen on a port, and everything we send to the exchange server on that port gets redirected to the domain controller. So we're basically able to connect to the domain controller through the exchange server. So although the domain controller itself is not exposed to the internet, because the exchange server is, and we have access to the exchange server, we can just tunnel our connections through the exchange server. So we're just gonna set up our, uh, our tunnel here. And this is tunneling to the RDP port so that we can log in via remote desktop. As you can see, it's gonna make the exchange server listen on port 2222, and then it's gonna tunnel that to the, um, the domain controller on port 3389, which is the remote desktop port. So we're just gonna run that. And now, if we bring up uh, the shell, we should be able to remote desktop into the exchange server on port 2222, and that will get forwarded to the domain controller. So now we're basically logging in via remote desktop to the domain controller, 
and we have the password that we dumped in plain text, which is backup password. Um, I keep getting it wrong here. So the, the password is just uncreatively backup password one, two, three, exclamation mark. And we enter that in here. And now we are onto the domain controller. And as it happens, this was a domain admin account. So we have full unrestricted privileges to the domain controller and any system on the network. So what actually went wrong here? Well, in this case, what the administrator had done is they'd set up a scheduled task which runs under the backup service account and it runs a backup every day at 3 a.m. Now, when you do task scheduler and you need a, uh, an account to be able to log in when there's no user on the system, you have to provide it a username and password because what it's gonna do is it's gonna take that username and password, log on to the system, run the scheduled task, and then log back off. Now, if you're running tasks that run when a user is logged on, you don't need any credentials at all. But if these tasks need to run when there's no users on the system, then there's gotta be a credential for it to use. And these are one of the few credentials on Windows that are actually stored in a way that we can retrieve them as plain text. They're not hashed, they are simply encrypted, and as system, we can actually just ask the system to decrypt them for us. Now, though, it is pretty popular to use task schedule in this way uh, it's a good way to do housekeeping because you don't really want to be running any uh, like memory or CPU or network intensive tasks during the day when users are on your network you might want to run your backups like quite late at night when no one's going to be logged on so this would be a pretty standard setup to use um, but as I said task scheduler is one of the only places on Windows that still stores credentials in a way that we can retrieve the plain text password um, so what did we learn and how can we remediate it? Task scheduler is extremely risky when used this way. Just don't. If you have to, use a local account and use the least privileges possible. Like principle of least privilege is the best thing you can do here. Um, personally, I would recommend just going away from task scheduler in general, but if you do absolutely have to use it, use a local account, use the least privileges possible, and try and have a different account for each machine. You don't want credentials that can be taken from one machine and then used to log into another, uh, because that just facilitates a very easy lateral movement. And also, you're gonna wanna rotate these service account credentials as much as you can, because if you leave them the same and they were stolen three months, two years ago by an attacker, and someone purchases them or comes into possession of them at a later date, they can now just log into your network. And a lot of the time these credentials don't have 2FA because they're meant for service accounts, they're not meant for interactive logon, which means uh, there's really nothing else to stop them. Once they get that username and password, they can just log into your network. Now, one thing you can do is use bait credentials wherever possible. Uh, I've just explained why task scheduler is a bad idea, but that makes it a very good idea for bait credentials. If we make an account named super admin, please don't, do not use, and we shove that into the task scheduler and then the attacker does this attack and they see an account named super admin do not use, ooh, that's probably a super admin account. We might wanna log into that and you would just set that as an account with absolutely no permissions whatsoever and uh, have a notification that whenever that account is used, it sends a five alarm fire alert to your security team and it isolates the machine. And that way, if the attacker does, do, uh, does manage to dump credentials, there's a good chance it's gonna alert you before they actually find a real credential which they can use to pivot on your network. Now, the other big thing, and this is a mistake I see happen all the time, is do not assume just because there's no users on this machine, it's not a workstation, there's no one to click weird links or run weird files, that it doesn't need an EDR. If an attacker comes across an exploit, especially a zero day, they're going to end up as a user of that machine and they're gonna do all the same things that a malicious user would do on a workstation, which are all things that an EDR can detect and stop. So you are gonna to wanna to have EDRs even on your Exchange server, like anything that 
an attacker could possibly end up on should have an EDR. And EDRs have all kinds of rules to prevent this specific attack. Mimikatz is a very well-known tool. It needs to interact with the system in a lot of ways that no normal software would really do. So it is actually quite easy to detect. So if that system had, had an EDR running and I ran the command I did, that would immediately send an alert to the security team and it would probably also get blocked at the um, at the system level. Like it wouldn't just be a notification. Most EDRs would actually be able to block that command from even doing anything. Um, the next thing is group managed service accounts. They're great. They allow you to manage the credentials externally in a way that's less likely to get caught up on the system in such a way that an attacker would be able to dump them. It also facilitates automatically rotating the passwords at pretty high frequencies, so you don't have to worry about like going in and manually changing passwords. It, um, it can centrally manage the credentials from the domain, meaning that we can change the password as frequently as we like, and that update will be pushed to all the machines. And finally, system hardening. There are some built-in features on newer versions of Windows that do very, very well to prevent Mimikatz. You have LSA protection, which basically makes the uh, process that Mimikatz dumps credentials from protected. And when it's protected, that means even with system privileges, we can't interact with it. Now, there are still ways we could get into the uh, LSAS process, and that's via the kernel. If we load a driver into the kernel, we can disable that protection and then still dump credentials, which is where things like credential manager and memory integrity and core isolation come in, because that takes things in a step further. It takes the entire LSA process and it puts it in its own like virtual machine. Like it uses the system hypervisor to completely isolate the LSA process from the rest of the machine. Now that's all I have for you. I'm gonna send things back to Rich in the studio.